Il passe au ouais Super bel artiste Super oh, Encore un but sensationnel The Uniformed Handball Hour is here. It's me, Brian Campion, Alice Kulesh, and Chris O'Reilly with you once again. And we have a very special guest on the podcast today, CSM Bucharesti's head coach, Adrian Vazale. And he talks to us all about his journey um, in coaching from coming into the club in 2014 and of course their big success in 2016 with winning the Champions League. He was involved in the coaching staff there and now he is at the helm in a club which I think is fair to say has gone through its fair share of head coaches. So he did pretty well for himself to stay in the job as long as he did. So boys, a lot going on. A lot has happened in the handball world uh, since we last spoke and I think probably the best place to start maybe is with the conclusion of the men's Champions League group phase. What do you think? Or what were your main impressions from that? What, what, what were some of the games that stood out for you, some of the performances? So can, can I ask a question? Did any of the games on the last round really matter? Yes. Why? Why? <laughs> well, yes, they did. The Plotsk, Plotsk, Plotsk. no? I yeah, mean, yeah, Plotsk was... That, that was a big turnaround. Plotsk, of course, qualifying ahead of Zagreb, uh, beating Porto by one goal in the end. All right, I'll tell you that why. Was, that was a big one. Płock beating Porto <laughs> to qualify. Magdeburg beating Dinamo Bucharesti to finish second place. Uh, Gheorghi beating Zagreb to finish fourth and face Alborg in the playoffs. Um, Paris, Paris against Vesprem didn't really matter except for Vesprem not, uh, not winning. Elverum Kiel and Seged Nantes, both teams trying their best to not finish third in the group. Uh, not coming through in the end and and Zagreb yeah Zagreb losing that same game against Giogi I talked about earlier <laughs> a lot, it was a lot, it was quite a lot like if you think like if we're looking at the playoff picture and the the route to the final four I think there was a lot of important results on that final group day I think also it's fair to say as well Barca beating Kielsa once again just to remind them that they'll always beat them forever <laughs> and they'll uh, <laughs> Kielsa will, will never be sure of a win over, over Barca just driving that nail home once more but uh, yeah, I, from, I sense from your tone of question Alex you weren't uh, particularly enamoured with the last day of action yeah I, I don't know I think uh, to be fair that um, piece of Plotsk win was really dram- dramatic um, I think that saved us. I think especially going into that very last day, I was just like, oh, they, these games, because Magdeburg, Magdeburg had already secured their spot and Geoge had pretty much secured their spot. And I was kind of like, oh, you know, this should be where a lot of things are happening. Uh, maybe there, there, there wasn't as much. But I think, Chris, you've convinced me. There's a lot that happened. It set up some absolutely tasty playoff matches. Um, I think Veshprem will be absolutely mm-hmm. kicking themselves for qualifying third in the group. They had it in that game against PSG. They had every opportunity to win. They led for most of the game. And now they're facing Zeget. And it's, it's something that you predicted last week, Chris. And I think, you know, a game like that, all form goes out the window. And Veshprem are going to be shaking in their boots like they, they will be going into that match in the same you know they could have played any other team i think if they come up against keel or not they're probably not going to be as scared as coming up against seged mm-hmm. who have been their achilles heel so i think vestrem will be absolutely kicking themselves the other playoff uh ties that were confirmed is that there's a danish derby as well Albor playing Geo Gay. Again, Albor. Um, a lot of the times, Geo Gay have, have had the better of them over the last couple of seasons. So it's going to be really interesting to see which one goes through real 50 50 game just because it's a local derby. Uh, Kiel 
ended up with uh, Dinamo Bucharesti, who they're probably going to be pretty happy about. Um, Dinamo have looked decent in this competition, but uh, Kiel, even though they tried their best, they still got a nice matchup. <laughs> and then lastly, uh, it's Nantes coming up against Fiesta Plotsk. I'd say Nantes were probably cheering for Porto in that last game that Wiesel Plotsk won. Uh, I think they'd prefer to play Zagreb than Plotsk, who also have Kosorotov back. Uh, I think he makes a big difference. And Mindesia is also back for Plotsk. So while Plotsk haven't been the best team in this competition, they might be a real thorn for Nantes, who uh, at times they do better against the, the best teams. You know, it's it's this type of game that actually is dangerous for them. So, in terms of playoff matches, that's a lot of fun. Yeah, big time. Really, first time I've been really excited about the playoff round. Because usually they are, there's maybe one game that you can think, okay, that's going to be the close close game. But then it's, you know, Vesprem beating teams by 20 goals and, and stuff like that. That's what I think about in the playoff round. That's not going to happen this time. I, I know... Some people, I mentioned this last time, probably hate the idea of teams from the same country facing off in this round, but I think it's great. It adds a bit more spice, and um, you said that form goes out the window for Seged against Vesprem. Um, I actually don't know who hates the idea of facing each other more in the Danish Derby, given the current form, because I, I would have thought maybe this time last year or a few months ago, Gio Gio would be like, okay, here's our chance. Now it's probably Alborg saying, oh, okay, now here's our chance to get to the quarterfinal. Um, but yeah, really hard one to pick there, uh, which team is going through. What do you think, Brian? Yeah, I'm looking at them and I'm kind of wondering which one I look forward to the most. And I think I agree with you as well. Those countries coming up against each other, um, for us on the outside anyway, are just are just great. And I think that really adds a real cherry on top to the to the playoff the playoff games and with uh carlos pastor being in his last season with zegged it's could be his last outing in europe with the zegged team so i th- i just think that they're going to be two really really incredible games and i honestly really hard to call i mean on paper you're going to say look vesprem with the form they've had all season but it feels like zegged in the last few weeks have just Im- have improved uh and that's it they're not they're not the Zegged maybe of we we talked of two seasons ago, but I think they are starting to come together a little bit and get some performances in. Um, so who knows what's going to happen in that one? And the other, so Płock Nantes. I I I think you said Alex there that Nantes would be very happy with Płock, but I mean Płock do have a, a performance in them always, you know. No, so. no, I I actually I actually said that it's going to be. Uh, they would have been happier with uh, Zagreb, is mm-hmm. what I said. So I think it's going to be oh, sorry, yeah, okay, a, a really heard. fun okay. game that one. But also just on the on the Zeged, um, have you seen them just throwing around money around every single top coach in European handball yes. over the last couple of weeks? You know, they had that uh, whatever two million budget offer for transfers for the Talon de Shubaya family. They have now. Um, uh, it's rumored that they offered a hundred thousand to Savehoff or uh, Mikkel Applegren. They're really desperate to get a top top coach in. Mm-hmm. Hundred thousand. Yeah. yeah, it's it's tasty, isn't it? Like, I mean, w- which coach do you think would now suit Zeged? If you could, if you were the the man in charge over at Zeged and you had to pick a coach out from a top European coach, one that would suit the club, suit the culture of the place, because you know they've had Palace Castor for how long? How long has he been there now for? I, I don't remember him not there, to be honest. So it's been quite a long time. Uh, but it must be, what, at least eight yeah, years, no? Even, if not even more. more. Sure, he won the he won the Europe, uh, EHF Cup with them back about eight years ago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> EHF Cup, right. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, so it's been much longer than that. I, I think the Mikkel Applegren one is interesting. Um, you know, the, the Scandinavian coach coming over would be a pretty dramatic change in that squad. You know, it's it's had that Spanish style to them for a long time uh you know changing that squad around it would have to be a really really big squad turnover i think that's the only mm. issue i see with michael applegren you know the run and gun style that save a half play and that michael applegren you know engages in 
is you know that Sega team I- is not set up for it at all. I'm hesitant to start quoting from Wikipedia here, but I think this is actually hilarious. You know, on Handball Wikipedia, where they if they if there isn't a confirmed transfer, they put the question mark beside it for like the the additions for 2020 the next season Sega's one right now is fucking hilarious right so transfers for the 23 24 season joining all of these except for one are question marks Mikael Applegren coach from Saverhoff Daniel Fernandez left wing from TV Bittenfeld Seaman Pitlick Lucas Jorgensen and Emil Madsen all from Gioki <laughs> Kevin Gullickson on the right wing, Norwegian from Minden. Uh, Emil Kerry Imsgard, goalkeeper from Norway, from Elverum. And Tobias Grundahl, playmaker from Elverum, another Norwegian. So there is your squad overhaul for the Swedish coach. A bunch of the best Norwegians and Danes. <laughs> Could you imagine? You take it. You take it. <laughs> that is the way to. Uh, but how, they would actually be splashing the cash for that. How? I mean, handball Wikipedia is like when it comes to the transfers is generally quite like okay, they're not going to put it there unless it's a really strong rumor. I think someone's taking the piss with this one. I think so. I, I think yeah, the, yeah. The Mikkel Apgren news came out. There hasn't been any. Um, I don't know. I haven't seen any news about denial. No. of that or let's say Michael Applegren distancing himself from that rumor um, but yeah it seems does it fit with his projected outlook like what 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 was Michael Applegren's goal you know probably to coach Sweden yeah. right yeah because he is the assistant coach right now uh, so I think yet yeah, the he would end up coaching because I remember we we mentioned him maybe being a Norway coach candidate at one point before they hired their new coach. See, I, I don't know. But Seged is a great opportunity. Um, so, uh, you know, one that I'm thinking of, if I were to pick a name right now, because I think he's leaving his club this season, Tony Girona. You got the Serbians in there. He's Spanish. I mean, that's he's a- due a big yeah. uh, Champions League club. I feel like, I mean, that for Tony is a huge opportunity, but I feel like Seged might not go for that. I think they need probably a bit, an already a bit more of established name to come in. Mm-hmm. But I think Tony would do a great job there. But I think maybe they'll want to go for someone who is a bit more a household name. If Jordi Ribeiro spoke more English, I mean, do you think he, he could do a good job in there? I, I was actually thinking that, you know, he, he's had a nice life in Qatar for a while, but, uh, you know, uh, is he ready for a big challenge has he done with that in his career you know how, how old is Jordi Ribeiro uh, th- 60 I think or 59 I think or that 70 I, I just yeah. I got confused between Jordi Ribeiro and uh, Valero Rivera. ah yes the Qatar national team coach, ah yes who is 70 and probably not looking to yes. go into the cauldron of the Zegan no. Arena in his <laughs> retirement. No, no. Um, I mean, yeah, why Why would you do that to himself? He's done enough. The last option, which I think they should explore, is Roberto Perondo, uh, who is currently the coach of Egypt, but he's not going to be staying on because uh, Egypt did mm-hmm. want him. I know he's at Melsungen, and he hasn't had a great time there, but... You know, you could pretty much, you know, they they could sweeten that deal, tell him, you know, this this is your future here. Maybe he doesn't want to leave Melsung in in the state that it is, but uh, yeah, that could be an option. Coach, all Spanish coaches. Yeah, Spanish. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, David Davies is another guy who came into my mind there that he's obviously been living in in Hungary for a while. But do you think maybe his reputation's gone off the boil slightly, and he might not be? What to be looking for there? That's that's the oh, feeling I have anyway at the moment. To get a former Vesperm coach in, yeah, it's a bit like good Liverpool to Everton. You know, we've seen that. Exactly. We've seen that's gone in the past. It's happened with players, but I think for a coach, it's another another thing altogether. Uh, um, yeah. Oh well, we'll yeah. see. I'm sure that'll come to fruition in the coming months. And I, I think the fact that it hasn't been set now after the international window is why they're getting a little bit desperate and why they're throwing money around now because they they find it hard to imagine, you know, getting someone in that 
they actually want. It hasn't been done in the usual, let's say, transfer window. So, yeah, they're going to have to start splashing the cash. One coach we know is not going anywhere for now is Adrian Vasile, uh, the CSM Bucharesti coach who has bucked the trend of CSM Bucharesti coaches being hired and fired. Adrian Vasile took over the reins and he's uh, managed to stay in the position throughout that time and has done a fantastic job. He's also a coach that uh, we've had on our mind to, to interview for quite a while and it proved to be uh, very much worth the wait. Brian and I had a chance to speak to him about his journey into coaching, uh, the influences he's had over the years and what it's like to manage a team with so much expectation both internally and externally. Adrian, thank you so much for joining us uh, on the podcast. And uh, it's been a very impressive season for Chesame so far and uh, a joy to talk to you while I guess there's no quiet time in the season for you, but at least Champions League wise, you have a chance to to sit back and uh, enjoy a bit of the madness from afar for a while. Well, uh, actually, now it's a it's a period of break <laughs> because the national teams are gathering and uh, I have to say it's a it's a well deserved and uh, much weighted uh, rest because I think the the level of uh, tiredness in the mental way, uh, actually more than physical, at some point comes to very dangerous uh, moments. And um, it's actually, it feels good to have a little uh, break for some days. We'll get a little bit more into uh, the season a little bit later, but I want to, since, as Chris said, we have a little bit of a break now, maybe go a little bit further back than you're maybe used to. We're going to talk to back when you you were a winger yourself back in the day. And talk to us about leaving playing and going into coaching. I mean, when you were a player, did you always think that, okay, I have a bit of coaching in me? Were you one of those players in the dressing room who was saying, maybe we should be doing this or that? Or when did you realize that you were going to become a coach or when did that kind of come up? Mm. Well, uh, it started when I, uh, once I got into the sports university in Bucharest. And then uh, I think the biggest thing that uh, that helped me in the university was that uh, the, the teachers there and the studies were actually making me understand uh, why is, is it good to, to do these things with this number of reps? Why is it good to do it in this part of the year? So it actually put some puzzles in my head, uh, which is very, very analytic and I like order. So the to me the university helped in the way of understanding why how much when uh, and of course in a way it made me also question my coaches at that time which uh, for a coach it should not be any kind of uh, surprise because you're always uh, questioned by uh, by your audience by your players in many ways so um, it started in a way very early but it had all the time the the love for handball uh of course i didn't know that i would want to become a coach in that moment i actually decided to be become a coach actually after many years even if even when i started to be let's say in this uh, stuff part uh but the love for handball and uh, this was big um, ever since i started actually very big love for handball when you decided you were going to become a, a coach then were there any particular coaches in the handball world that had a, a big impact in your philosophy I, I, I'm always saying that uh, I was educated in Steaua Bucharest and ever since I was very young I could see all the big legends of Romanian handball uh, that either I saw them for example on pictures in the office or either they were my coaches, my mentors. So from them I, I picked up a lot of things uh, over the years and I'm, I'm very lucky I think to, to be able to, to be part of this. Um, and after that, uh, ever since I joined the CSM Bucharest project in 2014, then I was again lucky to meet many international coaches uh, with again, uh, maybe too many coaches in, in some parts of, of the seasons. Uh, actually, I, I believe that I try to get the best out of everybody in this way because to me it was a very, very good experience. So I was lucky to get influenced by the Romanian uh, school of handball. And then I also got to the international with uh, working with Balkans, working with Scandinavian. Uh, it, all, it helps big time. Uh, then I would say turning point. Uh, one of the turning points was when I joined the, the Montenegro national team. 
uh, I think three years of uh, extremely good experience and uh, a place and a team and a country that I will always cherish. It will be very close to, to my heart. And um, in terms of, let's say, if I will pick two coaches uh, that influenced me a lot, was the first one was Mete Klit, the first coach of Chesame Bucharest, the Danish. And uh, then it was Per Johansson, which we uh, worked many years together and uh, actually bounded into a very nice uh, uh, and very funny um, friend relationship. So those two were, let's say, the, the last ones that completed this uh, bubble. Otherwise, I'm trying to get uh, influence and inspiring from uh, from all the coaches I'm seeing uh, around me, watching handball or, or being everywhere. Can I just ask you quickly about uh, Per Johansson? Because, uh, yeah, you seem to have also from an outside perspective, quite a, a nice relationship. Um, and he, for a Swedish coach, is probably the most uh, Balkan Swedish coach there is out there. And uh, he seems to really yeah, cherish that side of the, the sport as well. And the, I guess, to put it in a simple way, the, the fighting or never say die attitude of the players. Yeah, he, he he is very Balkan, <laughs> maybe the the most Balkan, and it's it's actually very funny to see. In sometimes even in the timeouts of Netherlands, he throws in some kind of Balkan word from uh, from time to time, <laughs> and we are texting and then joking. Uh, but I think some things uh, stick with you, and uh, if you if you get into another culture that uh, actually feels very close to you like a, like a shirt like a jacket then you embrace it and uh, that's why i think per uh, could handle himself in also in east european uh, russia romania uh, montenegro and now in netherlands so um uh, very crazy in a very nice uh, way uh, with a lot of again love for the handball for him as well and uh, would work ethics um, and and a guy that uh, um, I really enjoyed being next to and we are all the time in contact we are speaking all the time and uh, so uh, he is maybe in the last five six years uh, the closest uh, coach the closest person to me in, in the coaching world so you said when you joined the project in 2014, it was only two years then before the club itself probably had the, its biggest weekend in history in 2016 when you won the Champions League. You're probably asked about this all the time. Of course, you were part of the coaching staff back then. When you look back at it now, why did it work that year? Why did everything fall into place? Was it just a special combination of players or timing or what? What do you put it down to in 2016? Uh, it, it was a special combination of, uh, of many ingredients. I think we had uh, a good mix of players, uh, a good mix of players that knew how to win and lose medals. Um, then I think we picked in a perfect moment for the season in the quarterfinals because until then it was not such an easy season for us uh, back then. Uh, and then I think going to final four, it always remembered about I don't know when was it was it Denmark in 1992 in football that they yeah. they went into the European Championship from the beach and of course we were not coming from the beach. But for us, we, it was already uh, an achievement in a way. And we didn't have any kind of, of pressure on our shoulders. And I remember when we walked in the hotel there in Budapest, seeing Gior, seeing uh, Vardar and, um, and Budujnos, they were, you know, their eyes were, were red of, of wanting it. And we just, uh, we were just relaxed and enjoying. Maybe it's one of those scenarios that, it's very hard to take place again in the same way. Uh, and I don't believe it will it will ever happen like that. Maybe for a different team, but not for us. Uh, so we came there and, I don't know, in the first game with with Vardar, we, we just came out absolutely amazing on the on the court. And it it felt like a, a very easy game and too easy from many aspects. But it's... Um, it, it was a perfect, uh, perfect moment, perfect weekend when everything aligned uh, like in a fairy tale, I would say. Yeah. And Bella Gildan's 15 goals, which is <laughs> uh, something, that's one of those things you, as you said, it it doesn't happen to, to anyone just on a, on a, on a given day. Um, but after that, and I just want to ask you for your perspective on, on, let's say, the journey between that title and you taking over as the the head coach because um i guess there was this 
you know, maybe chase, trying to chase that same feeling, to chase the same success for the club. And if I'm not mistaken, there were eight coaches then in the following three and a half years before you finally were given the the reins of the team. And but you were part of the part of the squad or part of the team in, in some way or another for for all of that. How was that for you, kind of being being a part of that, seeing it all? Uh, seeing so much transition over and over again and I guess uh, on your perspective if I'm not mistaken just waiting for you to get the opportunity to take over well when you're part of East Europe you know that uh, people want success people want success very fast and they don't want to wait there is very limited patience in this part of Europe to me it, it feels and it felt normal because I was part since I was young of a club that always had to win. Being part of a, a club like Stella, you never have in your brain the idea that you you might lose. And that's that's a winning culture that I was again very lucky to be part. And I think this continued in Chesame Bucharest in the same way. Of course, not, uh, not every time this is real. There are people that have to, in the coaching staff, in the club, in the management, or in people even in the city hall, that uh, sometimes have to understand that it's not so easy to to win the Champions League uh, even the second year after you won your Champions League. And uh, I remember to us it was actually a very big drama in the second final four when we lost with Vardar in the semifinals. And I had the moment where I was speaking with people from my management and I said, uh, uh, but look guys, tomorrow we can play for, for the medal. And uh, I know we won it last year, but this year and what will come after the, the winning year is going to be completely different because people would not look at Chesame Bucharest as the team that came first to to the final four. So we have stepped into the big league, so we will be treated like a, like a big league player, not like an underdog. Um, so the underdog feeling was completely out after the first year, but the expectations were uh, were big and kept to be big uh, throughout uh, these years, just because we are from, in a way, we are from East Europe. I can maybe have a little, let's say, story just about Romania to understand. Uh, when Romania lost the final in men's in, uh, against Russia, former Soviet Union, uh, and, and then they lost, the, they actually, they, they won in a way the, <laughs> the silver in the Olympics. The second day in the biggest newspaper in Romania was titled that uh, they are the disgrace of Romania. Uh, so on that kind of a level, sometimes we can push it in uh, here when where we won the success. Um and regarding how I was dealing with, with this was that uh, I always had the fire to win. Uh, I have it more and more. Uh, even now, sometimes um, everything I, th- I think about is just is just winning. And, and I want to win and I, we have hunger to win. Uh, but in the beginning, to me, it was a learning process. And I was, uh, again, lucky to be part of this because... I never got the the pressure that the first coach gets, never. Uh, so I was in a way in a spot where I could do my work, uh, be dedicated to what I do, but still learn on a, on a free ticket in a way. Wow. So I decided we, learning is something that I want. And I was always, even when I was very young, I loved to learn uh, things from the people around me. So to me, it was a free ticket of, um, of trying to become better. And... Uh, the moment when I actually knew that I would be, or I could be actually ready to to try, um, was in the season when uh, when uh, Thomas Ride was the coach, and uh, I was actually pe- preparing. Uh, maybe in the last two seasons, I was preparing for the moment, uh, trying to make all kind of scenarios in my head about how should I be, how should things be, and you never know, they will never be like in your head in many ways. Uh, but I was trying to to make a scenario of a movie, uh, how to do it when I will be doing that. And uh, it came actually pretty fast because Thomas, uh, I think it was on uh, 1st October, um, only after three months of being coach of Chess and Abuker, he decided that he wants to take only the national team. And um, I remember I got a call from my manage- manager in that moment, who is also now my, the manager of Chesame Bucharest, Vladena Kescu. And uh, he told me about it. And I was like, okay, now you prepared for it. You wanted it. Uh, okay, now it's time. 
So <laughs> that was, uh, let's say, the long story short in a way about me. And do you feel like uh, you have been kind of treated in the same way that while you, as you were, when you were the second coach, given a bit more patience since then, or maybe not felt the same pressure because that was in October, 2019, you're, you're still in the job now. You've done a fantastic job with the team. Also, let's say bringing in new generations of the team, but have you felt the support as well over these years? I think a coach will feel, of course, it's very important to have support. Uh, without it, it's it's a it's a very hard uh, life uh, from your management and and actually especially to me from the team. Um, because to me, if if a coach loses the loses its team, loses the trust of the team in 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 him or in her as a coach, then it actually doesn't matter if the management supports you or not, because it will be a very hard uh, daily job. Um, but I was lucky to to have extremely good characters uh, around me in the team, in the players, and also in the coaching staff. So the day to day life was uh, was not easy, uh, but was was good. I think we were very loyal to each other. And um, I'm also now remembering when we had maybe two years of big problems with the salaries. It was not easy to control. Uh, the team and to focus focus the team for the game, but uh, extremely lucky with the characters uh, that I had around me. Um, otherwise, you know how it is with support. When the team plays good, you have the support. When the team doesn't play good, people start to doubt. And uh, again, here in Romania, because winning and uh, and not only winning is is the thing in CSMA, you you have to perform uh, very good. Sometimes. Winning is is not enough. Not even for us in the team, uh, winning is not enough. Which at some point it uh, it doesn't help, uh, but it's how it is. You have very big expectations from inside the group, and uh, only a good performance can be something that sh- that makes us, let's say, not maybe satisfied or or okay w- with us. Uh, so moments with the support, moments with not so much support. Um, but I think there were always around me some people that believed in me. And uh, if it's a player, if it's somebody else, uh, even people that maybe I don't know, uh, I would like to thank them because it's very important as a coach to have uh, support. From the outside, it seems like to me that the the Romanian fans, they can be, when things are going well, obviously, as like, like you said, they're they're over the moon. And when things are not going, even as you also as you said, not so well, they can be very kind of aggressive in their uh, messaging. Uh, how do you deal with that? And like... It, that's sometimes obviously psychologically difficult for coaches who are working with big teams in Romania because I think it's they really uh, you're only as good as your last result. It seems like. Well, the fans of CSM Bucharest because we are um, uh, we are a club that is uh, only uh, 15 years old. Uh, we have created in all these uh, years of Champions League uh, a crowd that. Um, that comes to the game and and enjoys, for example, the, the tries to enjoy a performance and tries to enjoy the people on the court. And I think the fans of CSM Bucharest are having a very nice uh, way of being next to the team, even when it was tough for us. They were uh, always there. Um, of course, now the social media and everything else is uh, is full of people that um, are free to to speak up their minds and to tell their opinions and if you for example follow the the platforms of in Romanian handball comparing to other teams in Europe then you will see actually much bigger engagement in uh, in the comments or in that part um and i think it's part of that about the fact that people want success and the people want in Romania to to find some of the reasons to be happy and to celebrate some things whether whether it is sport or um, another domain but sport will always give you maybe two times or three times per week the opportunity to do it. So uh, I think from this big urge, uh, desire to to celebrate a big thing will also come up um, the other part because we are dealing, I, I many times saying this in handball, we are dealing only with love and hate, only with black and white. Uh, and handball with the rhythm it's played, it brings you from a two goal lead to a minus one lead, uh, from minus six to plus eight, uh, and so you are dealing with a lot of emotions. And um, 
to me, I actually try to stay away uh, from many of those. And I try to, to surround myself with people that uh, are very correct in criticism and uh, with people that will always know the reality of the team from inside, uh, because that's um, that's very important. And I I am this is a big lesson from Per actually uh, trying never to lose the big picture of the team and not put myself into many details because I think details is uh, something that you can never escape if you want to go too deep in them. Talk to us then about your your current squad. It's a nice mixture of uh, of local or Romanian players and then the the international contingent that is always there, good French and Norwegian pockets in the team as well. How how do you see your role with a team like this in making an international group of players uh, gel together? Uh, and, and with that, how important are the personalities of the players when it comes to signing them and bringing them into a club like this? First of all, about uh, about the players, we are, of course, you're always trying to, to bring the, the players that show the skills on the court. But you always try to, in a way, bring the the characters and the human skills of the people uh, in a team. Uh, and sometimes you can do it. Sometimes you you're not. But you, um, I believe I believe a lot into the fact that uh, the character and the and the human skill will always help a team process in such a long, uh, let's say, process that it's a season because uh, it it feels like uh, 10 marathons not like one marathon so um, you need your skills but you also need your human uh, human skills there and uh, there have been some players in this in this uh, CSM Bucharest uh, club that have been extremely strong characters uh, extremely strong competitors and i i was i was actually saying in a newspaper in Romania some other day that I still feel in Chesame Bucharest now, I still feel a little Gruba, I still feel a little bit of Carmen Martin, and I still feel uh, a little bit of Linnea Torstenson just in the last uh, period, because I know that they are, uh, with their hearts, they are, they are here, and their aura is still a little bit here with us um, as well. Um, then I think it's, uh, of course, dealing with a lot of uh, nationalities, in a way, you have to make everybody understand what's the reality of the of living your life in Romania and in Bucharest. What are the team expectations? What's how how is the real life here uh, comparing to maybe other places where they have uh, been? And in a way, it's uh, making them understand that to perform in in, in Chesame with the, let's say with a T-shirt of Chesame on, it's not an easy thing. Um, but the ones that are real competitors, they all the time enjoy uh, this because. Uh, I'm also giving this example. If you're playing in Barcelona or Real Madrid, you have all the pressure of the world on you because you're you're watched on on all the world. So, to me, this is is a routine for top teams. It's not a pressure. I like to call it routine because this is a normal life, and I'm the one responsible with, of course, with the help of my of my staff and people from the club, to make uh, players feel good, feel. Uh, as home as possible, uh, as fast as possible to to feel at home in Bucharest, and I think it's a nice environment. It's a city that that helps a lot in in this aspect. And then it's about uh, making them understand how to put their skills in a way that they will help uh, the club first integrate into the way that the team and the club wants them to to play, and then bring their skills, their shining, uh, let's say, skills after that. And when we talk about Big personalities. Um, Christina Niago, obviously your your captain. Um, I, it always surprises me when you talk to someone from Romania and you realize we all know in the handball world she's a really big player. But when you talk to someone who's from Romania or involved in Romanian handball, just how big she is in Romania. How do you, how is it for you to coach a player like that who is probably one of the, is probably one of the biggest sports stars in in Romania at the moment? How is it like to have a player like that in the team and deal with all the other things that come with that? It's a privilege. I'm uh, I'm very privileged to have Christina here. Um, from her, uh, of course, playing skills, but actually, the best thing about Christina is the is the thing that you maybe cannot see is the fact is the is the love is the passion for handball is the is the passion to dedicate her life so many years to try to to be the best and. Um, and to do actually everything in her life is about handball. 
so the dedication that Christina has um it's it's not easy to to follow at all uh otherwise um uh i always say that is not hard at all to work with christina if you have the right work ethics and if uh, christina will see that your dedication matches her dedication then you then you actually you can make a real good match and this is available also for the players and it doesn't matter if you are 18 or 35 if Christina will see that uh, you have the same desire to compete and it starts from a warming up game to absolutely everything, then she will uh, embrace you immediately. Um, I think this is what winners and people that want to win uh, do all the time. Uh, not not easy to be around them and to be uh, trying to be in their shoes. That's definitely not easy. But the great ones are 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 special, and uh, Christina is very special into normal things that she does, and she repeats every single day. We've had her on before, and you get only you get a small feeling of talking to her about these things you're talking about, and she's had so many obstacles to to overcome throughout her career, but also in recent years as well. And how has how has Christina? in recent years maybe has she changed a little bit in that regard with the injuries in particular and coming back from that has that given her a different perspective i know the last injury of christina was in uh, in the euro in 2018 and if you actually if you're going to watch those games that she played you will see that in the moment in the game with hungary when she got injured she got injured just because her body was uh, had enough and it was on the absolutely last uh, moment of, of of everything that the body had and i'm telling you that if tomorrow we have to play a game uh, and there will be a risk that christina might get injured christina will step in the court with all the risks and she will play uh and then actually it's it's my it's my uh, yeah. my moment when it's me with selling Pull her, her back. <laughs> now you need to stop because she she will not stop she will she wants to win and uh, this is amazing i actually get goosebumps now when i'm telling you about this so i said at the top of the hour that we would talk a little bit about this season i think the group that you're in was was absolutely crazy i mean great for us neutrals to watch maybe a bit stressful for all the other fans because it really went down to the wire especially at the bottom of the group but you kind of stayed away from all that chaos at the bottom had a, had a very strong season beat vipers uh, they beat you but you skip the playoffs and go straight to the quarterfinal. How happy are you with how the season has gone so far? I am that happy in a way that I understand that we have not won anything. Definitely to be from the beginning of the season in Champions League there on the top of the group. Uh, it's a very good feeling. Uh, maybe with each game, when the things go good, you establish uh, even more, a little bit of the winning uh, culture and uh, maybe the dream that you have in the end to win the competition actually starts to get even even bigger and even let's say better in your in your brain uh but i will have to say that we have we didn't have at all an easy season although maybe now from outside when you see the results it looks like okay this was nice no we we didn't have and um, maybe there were actually only two moments after uh, or three moments in the season so far that after a game we actually could allow ourselves to to be happy and to to be relaxed and to to enjoy that day otherwise it was not otherwise we were still trying to think uh, what we can do better we are still not at the level we should be we were still a lot of under preoccupation of trying to to be better and this to me comes from uh, either the hunger to to win and uh, the feeling that you can never get comfortable in uh, in in sports and I'm. I think what you said, Brian, before with this, with our group being crazy. I'm. I'm just thinking many times about Bittingheim. That when you know they they when the season started, Bittingheim looked like an amazing machine of handball. And to me, our game at home court in Bucharest and the game in in Germany was on absolutely top level. And I was enjoying those games a lot. But we could lose uh, just as well. And Vipers is now out of Champions League, although they won also against Vipers, the two times reigning uh, champions. 
and it, it's just amazing the level uh, we had in in, in this group uh so now back to the beginning of the question i think to have this break uh and not play the playoffs is very good because uh, if you look at the players that have been uh, part of international uh, competitions with the national teams ever since summer they didn't have a break and uh, the level of mental tiredness actually came in this end uh, in this february to us in chess and bucharest at a point of uh, a little alarm feeling um but i i guess it's it's also normal to to be like that uh and it's also these players you know week after week they're playing so many games uh, we are handball we are not football we don't have charter flights we don't have all these conditions that that uh, would help with the recovery and sometimes we lose four days to play a game away uh, and this creates uh, a problem but uh, happy that we we can be out of of the playoffs and that um, we have now two months i think to recalibrate again uh, start to build up a little bit on the on the shape and uh, prepare for the quarterfinals you said there there were some areas that you want to improve on without giving too much away what what areas that comes to your mind i th- i think uh, our attack although usually i start with defense but now i just started with our attack um i think we will uh, we will have this last part of the of the championship where we will have to even uh, uh, let's say top more of the potentials uh, potential of the players we have and then i think we can also add some uh, new ingredients uh, to become a little bit even more um, surprising for for our opponents be- sorry because i think we have the we have the quality to do that uh, in the team um then regarding our defense uh, I many times like to say that it, it's a lot about the basics. Um, it's a lot about the connection with the players. It's a lot about uh, um, the understand understanding that at some point you need help and uh, how should you actually ask for that help. So it has actually a big psychological part inside, I think, the defense. Uh, it's not only tactics, triangle, uh, uh, offensive, par in par or whatever. I think it has a lot of... Um, philosophical and psychological things um but i will i will try to improve on what we call clear signals and clear signals it's uh when the defense when the defenser uh will take a decision in such a good timing that everybody around him will understand in a very good moment what he wants to what he wants to do that's one thing and then i would like to improve on um, you know many times you're stuck on tactics and you're doing there your hours and trying to see the games and thinking okay how the game will be but i'm i'm telling the players that the game will be played uh, by itself and you have to connect very good and be in the moment when the game is played and think about the solutions that sh- are shown to you in that day not all the time thinking about tactics so in a way it's be in the moment use your tactics send a clear uh, send a clear signal and uh, just create a feeling that there are seven players on the court that are acting like uh, like one and um, i hope that now when we come back from the national team you know also by the fact that we can see the end of the season i think also from the mental aspect it will feel a little bit like okay we have done it until now then now there are two games that separate us for final four so let's uh, tune in uh, again how do you tackle the idea of you could pl- either play brest or team esberg in the quarterfinals do you start preparing for both or do you kind of as you said start to work on parts of your own game like you said the clarity and defense and, and such things rather than trying to prepare for either one or the other team well i actually have already started to prepare <laughs> <laughs> you can't tell us obviously stop any rice that <laughs> had on a, on, a, on a big board <laughs> and, um well in a way we have played against breast uh, now two times so i think uh, there are some things that's definitely we know about them and they know about us 
Um, and uh, now my first thoughts were actually trying to see uh, follow more Esbia this season because last years we were playing uh, against each other many many times. So now I'm actually trying to follow a little bit more Esbia to to be up to date on uh, on their game and um, you know the reality of uh, of their of them playing handball this season. Um, and we will prepare in a way for uh, for both but we will be the most important so it's mainly it will be about us and then it will be about uh, about our opponents uh, because i also think that sometimes you you can very easily lose the image of your team when you prepare a lot for the for the opponent opponents and a team that plays wednesday sunday wednesday sunday will not have so much time to be uh, let's say self-critic or um, to make auto auto analysis of, of your game because your new new opponent is in two days, uh, and this is something that we actually miss in Chelsea and Bucharest this time. But we have it now until we we will play the quarterfinals. We will have it, so we can go more deep into into us. On the format of the competition, we've had this Champions League format for a few years now, and um, from a coaching's perspective. If you could make certain changes, if they, if you could choose the Champions League format that you would like for the teams we have in Europe at the moment, uh, how would you like to proceed? The new format of Champions League, how it is now with two groups, I think it's uh, it's more attractive and, and tougher than it was before with four groups of four. Uh, definitely with the problem in Russia and with the war, uh, the fact that you miss Rostov and uh, CSKA, has created an impact on the quality of of some teams of uh, in Champions League. Maybe maybe one of uh, one of the things can uh, could be actually that uh, next season uh, maybe uh, there are some championships where even the number three uh, team um, is a strong competitor. I'm thinking now, for example, Ecast. They have the the quality to to be in uh, in Champions League. Um, uh, France, pretty sure, has won. Uh, even Romania, we have a strong league here. So maybe if we, if um, EHF wants to make it, uh, let's say, uh, more balanced in in quality level, um, then definitely some rules can be changed in the way that not only two teams from a country can be part of Champions League, and from this, of course, it will be uh, the draw will have to be different and not the same rules can apply. So maybe maybe this because now I have the feeling that the two groups with how the draw was were totally unbalanced. Uh, um, our group to to the other one, but um, no. I actually like to see the uh, the full part of the glass, and I like to understand that we have had a season where, uh, all due respect, we were not so challenged with most, but then all of the games we can we could never relax, and uh, we had to be on top of our game to to win every game. So I think this is a good advantage for uh, for the quarterfinals as well. So in general, the the two groups of eight, you're you're quite a fan of. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, okay. may, maybe uh, something that we should look up is uh, the number of of games that the play, the top players are playing, um, and the fact that you are having uh, some players from female and from men uh, with some kind of burnout syndrome um, should signal some uh, some flags around. Um, also, if you look at, uh, and I know handball is, is is very hard in a way to compare with basketball or with volleyball, that they are worldwide uh, coverage. Um, but I think to play a world championship or European championship in in two weeks, playing every, uh, let's say, almost every second day with the level of physical that is now in handball, I think it's it's damn hard for uh, for the players and. Uh, Protecting them and protecting uh, the actors, we have to think about uh, a way. Um, maybe have a world championship every four years should be the best way in a way. Okay. But in the fact that you want to promote handball and you want to make handball very visible on the TV, then you understand why is it every two years. But a message would be that we we actually have to think about ways to protect our actors in the court. It seems to me that it, like that when a coach decides to become a coach in women's handball at the highest level, that they often 
stick around in women's handball and don't really swap over there are some exceptions of course to it but do you ever see yourself going over to the men's side or men's coaching or have you ever thought about that the only thing in my mind for present and for future is to is to make it in Chesame Bucharest um, and to and to win here to chase the second gold medal of Champions League uh, so I want to I want to complete this circle then what life will will come after uh, I, we have to wait and see. And of course, I have absolutely no experience of coaching men. Although I was, I was, so I was, a, I was a player, but I have no experience. Um, but what I found out, because before Chesena Bucharest, I was coming from Stawa. What I find found out about my leadership in those moments was that um, the idea that you want to make the player in front of you aware of of what are the correct things and why he, sh he she should do those things apply even if you're working with men and female. Then there are some particularities that uh, definitely they are um, much more different in female handball and uh, makes it uh, makes every day a new day and makes every day to be very interesting. Uh, so for the moment, I enjoy a lot uh, doing this and uh, where, where the future will take me uh, I hope somewhere good, somewhere with uh, good people around me, with good mentality, people that will just uh, make me become even better. It's an exciting time for for men's handball it feels in in Romania. Finally, there seems to be a bit of momentum again with the with the national team and also with Dinamo and the uh, I'd say the Spanish influence coming in there. Have you had a chance to uh, to speak to Xavi Pascual or to experience a little bit of what Dinamo are doing? Well, um, uh, we were actually uh, close uh, from the first time when uh, when he came to the national team, and um, every time when we get a chance, we we speak to each other. Uh, he comes to our game, I go to their games. Nice. Uh, so we are um, we are supporting all the time each other with text messages and stuff, and. Um, then I was also part of uh, many times of sometimes lectures or sometimes talk about how how he uh, see his things and and leadership and uh, definitely there are these are moments that uh, just make you better and make you reflect. Actually, I'm lucky, but in a way, I want to surround myself with people that are very good. So uh, this is this has been always my intention to to find people around me that will point on the things that uh, there are correct and important things for me to to be better at and for me to get more inspiration which in a way I hope that I can be for uh, for others uh, but definitely uh, men's handball men handball now in in Romania with the Dinamo's second year in Champions League and I think with good results and important points um, puts Romania with three teams from one city, uh, which is amazing when you think yeah. about it, <laughs> in Champions League. And the number of points that uh, all the three teams uh, in Romania have won in this season, it's um, it's it's amazing. Uh, uh, so I think Romania is um, it continues to be a, an important and a strong player in handball and continues to follow on, his, uh, on its history. And it's a big history of handball in Romania. Thank you so much for uh, your time. We've went way over the agreed time. I hope you don't mind, but uh, we just couldn't stop asking questions because it was, it was very insightful stuff and uh, an inspiring chat. Uh, so thanks very much from both of us and uh, best of luck for the rest of the season. And maybe then we'll see you in, in Budapest. Thanks a lot, guys. It was, it, it, it was a pleasure. Wish you a great day. Thank you, Adrian, for the, the very interesting talk. A very insightful man, a lot to say. And I remember when I first met him back in... Well, I didn't meet him, but I saw him when uh, CSM Bucharest, he had won the Champions League. I was convinced he was a physio. And then I saw that he was appointed. I was like, oh, no, maybe he wasn't a physio after all. So that was my mistake. I'm sorry, Adrian. <laughs> I was like, the physio is doing well. And all of a sudden becoming head coach of CSM. But I had obviously the names mixed up there. Uh, no, but a very interesting guy, a very insightful. Uh, he has a lot to say about about women's handball. And I... I so I somehow have a feeling he won't be going anywhere anytime soon because he's doing a, a really, really good job with uh, with CSM. It feels like he's changed the culture there quite a lot in the club. So thanks once again for taking the interview. I think we'll leave it there for today. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you all to our Patreon subscribers and everyone else at home. We'll see you next time. From all of us, the other from Hamill Hour, goodbye. Goodbye.